It's time to get started tonight. <clears throat> Good to see everyone out. We had a very nice day today. Um, and I don't see any visitors tonight, so we'll, but we're glad uh, that you folks are here. Before we start, I've got a couple of announcements to make. I wanted to mention that I failed to mention it this morning, but it's on the overhead. Um, Becky, Becky Bush had shoulder surgery uh, a Thursday morning, and she's doing fine. She's, it's just, you know, it's gonna take a long time for her to recover. And then also her, her daughter, Amber, had gallbladder surgery the same day. And I understand Amber's in some pain, but she, it was successful surgery. Everything's okay. <clears throat> I wanted to mention to remind everybody that next week is daylight savings time starts. We need to set our clocks forward one hour. And also next week, next uh, a week from tonight, that we will offer um, the men an opportunity to attend our elders and deacons meeting uh, as we do from time to time and to give you an opportunity to sort of find out anything that's new and going on and also to give you a chance to make comments or ask questions or whatever. Those taking a leading part in our service tonight, Daniel's doing the Bible reading, Don Strother's got our opening prayer, and Todd would be our song leader, and Jim Bogle will be our closing prayer. So at this time, we'll go ahead and get started with our Bible reading. <laughs> Now Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he regularly paid the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But it happened when Ahab died that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So King Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time and mustered all Israel. Then he went and sent Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, or sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? And he said, I will go up. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Then he said, which way shall we go up? And he answered, by way of the wilderness of Edom. Before the prayer, I'd just like to say that Melba and I have really missed being here, and we've decided to come back into attendance and uh, be a part of the congregation again. It's the decision we made was on account of the COVID, uh, and we just got to learn to live with it. Let's pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, how it be thy great and holy name. Father, we're so thankful for this Lord's day. It's been ours to enjoy. We're thankful, Father, for thy son, Jesus, for all the blessings we have in Jesus. Spiritual blessings, material blessings, mental and physical blessings, Father, that you bless us with. We're thankful for the congregation that meets here at Sprangle. We ask you to continue to bless us, be with us, guide and direct us, shepherd and protect us. Father, we pray for our families. We pray for each member and each family of this congregation. That's our mercies and grace continue on with us and help us, Father, and all that we do, give us the wisdom, strength, and abilities to do the things we do. Father, we ask you to be with those that are sick, those that have had surgery, recovering, that you'll give them a speedy recovery, 
Ask you to be with those that been injured, accidents, ambulances, blow. That you'll continue to bless her, her body a heal, Father. We're so thankful, Father, that we are thy children, heirs to thy promises. We're thankful for the service here this evening. We pray, Father, that all that's said and done be in accordance with thy will and be acceptable and pleasing to thee. Father, we're weak and do things a lot of times that we shouldn't. We ask you to help us in our weaknesses, minister to our needs, forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
How do you know that the Bible is historically accurate? When you read about people and places and things and dates in the Bible, how do you know that what you're reading actually happened? How do you know that the people really existed? Because it's really easy for a skeptic to open the Bible and see, there's a whole bunch of names and stories in here. That doesn't mean it's true. And even worse, even worse, how do you know that the Bible isn't just propaganda? Isn't just what someone decided they wanted to write down to twist the facts in order to make sure that their idea was being propagated? How do you know? I want to talk about propaganda for just a second. We hear it all the time. In fact, anytime you turn on the news, some politician is spinning something, right? But let me, let me give you three rules of propaganda real quick. Let me tell you how propaganda works. First, you are the superior. Whatever, whether it be moral, physical, ideological, philosophical, like you have the high ground. And everything else just pales in comparison to your shadow. All right, that's rule number one of propaganda. Rule number two, your good is the greater good. So your win, that's everyone else's win too. And that's why everyone should buy into it. So you fill people with belonging and hope and pride. Rule number three of all propaganda, there's no such thing as bad news. Everything that might be construed as bad news, is either untrue, someone else's fault, or just a stepping stone in the right direction. This isn't just political cynicism 101. But the reason why I do that is because these rules about propaganda, they're true almost all the time. They're true if you're a Roman emperor who wants to depict himself as the god Apollo, on every coin that goes out. This is true if you're a Frenchman who wants to celebrate those who nobly died in all of the wars previously, in the Arc de Triomphe. This is true if you're an American and you want to solidify the messages of the Civil War and those who fought for it. But this is also true if you're a Moabite king living 900 years before Jesus who wanted to tell his version of the story. And this is really powerful because it's this man's endeavor for propaganda that's actually going to prove the historical accuracy of the Bible. We have been uh, now studying uncovered biblical archaeology, talking about various artifacts that have been found that impact people of faith to give us even more confidence in the faith that we have. And tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the Moabite stone, which is also called the Mesha steel. The Mesha steel. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to give you the story where was found what it is, and then I'm going to tell you why it matters, okay? So in the 1800s, amateur archaeologists were searching the Levant, that is the the land surrounding the ancient holy lands, and what they were looking to find was confirmation that the Bible was as true as it claims, that everything was historically accurate, and there was a man, hold on, I'm going to find this. His last name is Klein, um, who was looking in, uh, Frederick Augustus Klein was searching near Dibon, which is modern day Dibon in Jordan, just on the other side of what would be ancient Israel, of the Dead Sea. And while he was looking there, he found this huge rock. Now, if you go to Dibon, uh, at least at the time of this picture, 
you can see where the ancient ruins are, and there's actually a modern settlement just a little farther away to the south. And while he was there, he found this big, beautiful stone that had what seemed kind of like ancient Hebrew on it. And word of this um, got uh, traveled to Charles Clement Ganneau. Oh, by the way, when he found this stone, it was whole and unbroken. I'll tell you that story too. So Charles Clement Ganneau um, sent two messengers to Deban to try to inquire more about it. The first one came and successfully made a squeeze, is what they called it, which is basically an imprint of the writings on it so that they could use it for translation purposes. So basically he got a copy of a massive stone, which is great. Um, some, for some reason, the, the process to me is when people are trying to steal your credit card information. Take a piece of paper against the credit card with raised numbers, and then you just swipe a pencil across it for a little bit and it will give you the numbers, it will make a copy of it for you. So just so you know, I'm glad that they're changing credit card information. But they went and they made this copy of this stone so that you could use it for translation. So the first guy who went and found, or the first messenger, he did his job. The second one, I don't know what he said, I don't know who he said it to, but he so infuriated the Bedouin locals that they shattered it. They broke it into pieces and sold it off to different buyers. So now this thing is not only not whole, it's broken and it's being sold into different pieces. Well, that second messenger did not do his job. Or what his job was was so aberrant to the Bedouin locals that they were not going to accept it. Either one, Charles Gano, he was able to locate and acquire all of the pieces. And because he had already essentially made his copy, he was also able to put it back together as it should have been. And now it stands slightly broken with all of, most of the text still visible and legible. There are 33 lines of translatable text on this stone. And there are five lines that are missing. So a cool find, but what does it say? So now I want to tell you. I want to read to you the text of the Moabite stone, this Mesha steel. It says, I am Mesha, the son of Kemos Yati, king of Moab, from Dibon. My father was king over Moab for 30 years. And I was king after my father. And in Karko, I was made, the high, made this high place for Kimos, because he has delivered me from all kings, because he has made me look down on all my enemies. First off, key number one here to propaganda, what he's telling you is I win. And it's my God who helped me do it. Well, let's keep reading. Omri was the king of Israel. And he oppressed Moab for many days. Does that name sound familiar? Omri, king of Israel? Keep reading. For Chemos was angry with his land. His son succeeded him, and he said, He too, I will oppress Moab. In my days he did so, but I looked down upon him and on his house, and Israel has gone to ruin. Yes, it has gone to ruin forever. Omri has taken possession of the whole land of Mediba, and he lived there in his days, and half the days of his son, 40 years. But Chemos restored it in my days, and I built Baal Meon, and I made, it, made in it a water reservoir, and I built um, Kiriathaim. And the men of Gad lived in the land of Ataroth, uh, from ancient times, and the king of Israel built Ataroth for himself. And I fought against the city, and I captured it, and I killed all the people from the city as a sacrifice for Chemos and for Moab. And I brought back the fire hearth of you know, Daudo 
From there, I hauled it before the place of Chemos and Kirioth, and I made the men of Sharon live there, as well as the men of Maharith. And Chemos said to me, Go take Nebo from Israel. And I went in the night, and I fought against it from the break of dawn until noon, and I took it, and I killed its whole population, 7,000 male citizens and aliens, female citizens and aliens, and servant girls, for I put it to the ban of Astar Kemos. And from there, I took the vessels of Yahweh and hauled them before the face of Chemos. And the king of Israel had built Jahaz, and he stayed there during his campaigns against me. And Chemos drove him away before my face. And I took 200 men from Moab, all in its division, and I led it up to Jahaz. And I have taken it in order to uh, add it to Dibon. I have built Karko, the wall of the woods and the wall of the citadel, and I have built its gates, and I have built its towers, and I have built its house of the king. And I have made the double reservoir for the spring in the innermost of the city. Now, there was no cistern in the innermost of the city in Karko, and I said to the people, make each one of you a cistern in his house, and I cut out the moat for Karko by the means of the prisoners from Israel. And I built Aroer, Aroer, there you go. And I made this military road in Arnon, and I have built Beth uh, Bamoth, for it had been destroyed. I have built Bezer, for it lay in ruins. And the men of Dibon stood in battle order all for all Dibon, and they were all they were in subjection, and I am the king over the hundreds and in the towns which I have added to the land. I have built the house of Mediba and the house of Diblathaim. And the house of Baal Meon, and I brought their fragment, the block, the flocks of the land. And Horanaim lived there, fragment. And Chemos said to me, Go down, fight against Horanaim. I went down, and fragment. And Chemos restored it in my days. And from there, and I, and that's where it ends. Okay. So as you're listening to that, no, I'm talking to some Bible nerds in here. I know it. I know you've been studying your Bibles. Some of you have been studying your Bibles for a long time. Did any of that sound familiar? Okay, here's what might have sounded familiar. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 4 through 8. 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 4 through 8. 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 4 through 8. Do you remember the two names of this stone? It's the Moabite stone and the Mesha steel, okay? So the thing that came from Mesha, all right? 2 Kings chapter 3 and verse 4. It says, Now Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder. And he had to deliver to the king of Israel ten or one hundred thousand lambs and the wool of one hundred thousand rams. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So King Jehoram marched out of Samaria at uh, sorry at mu- that time and mustered all Israel. And he went and sent word to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, then The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to the battle against Moab? And he said, I will go. I am as you are, and my people are as your people. My horses as your horses. Then he said, by which way shall we march? And Jehoram said, by the way of the wilderness of Edom. Hold up. Do you see what you just read? You read the other side of the story. Because here's what Mesha wrote, if I can recap it for you. He said, I'm Mesha, I'm the king in Moab. And Omri, King Omri of Israel, persecuted my people for a long time. And his son did after that. And while he said that the events that he was talking about happened during the days of the son of Omri, technically there's been a couple generations uh, of, of Omri. So there was Omri, and then there was Ahab, and then Jehoram. And all of these things, according to the Bible, are happening during the days of Jehoram. That's not much of a contradiction 
if you simply take son of Omri as descendant of Omri, which is normal in Hebrew anyway. But the king of Moab then rebels against Israel. So when he's talking about the fact that he fought against Israel, he killed Israelites, and he took their cities, and he made their slaves build various places, all that's packed into, and he rebelled against Israel. So where the Mesha stone talks about Mesha's victories, the Bible goes back and says, yeah, but this is what happened afterwards. Where three kings, Edom, Israel, and Judah, are going to go down through Edom and they're going to attack Moab. Just in case you want to know the end of this story, um, start reading with me in verse 24. Let's just start there. But when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose and struck the Moabites till they fled before them. And they went forward, striking the Moabites as they went. And they overthrew the cities, and on every good piece of land men threw stone until it was covered. And they stopped every spring of water and fell all the good trees, till, it was on, or till only its stones were um, left in Kir uh, Harasheth. And the slingers surrounded and attacked it. When the king of Moab, Mesha here, saw that the battle was going against him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through opposite the king of Edom, but they could not. And he took his oldest son, here's where it gets horrific, he took his oldest son who was to reign in his place and offered him for a burnt offering on the wall. And there came great wrath against Israel, and they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. That's what you learn about Mesha. So let me unpack for just a few moments why all of this is important and what lessons we can learn from this discovery of a stone that was made 900 years before Jesus-ish. First, it specifically names Omri, king of Israel. Talk about a touchstone to the Bible being accurate. It is a foreign nation talking about an Israelite king. Second, it describes the subjugation of Moab. So Mesha, as he's talking about his relationship with Israel, he said, you know, Omri was terrible to my people, and his son was terrible to my people too. And while um, at the beginning of our section, what it says is that, I'm sorry, is that... uh, Israel forced him to pay 100,000 lambs and the the wool of 100,000 rams. That's a pretty high price. So it describes the subjugation of Moab, which is also confirmed in 2 Kings chapter 3. It corroborates then the account given in 2 Kings 3 about the rebellion and trying to fight off against Israel. It mentions Chemosh, the Moabite god, who is mentioned eight times in the Bible. So you actually, therefore, get a picture of the Moabite religion as well. In fact, one of the things that he says about Chemosh, he talks about him 12 times over the course of these 33 lines. Um, he, He talks about the fact that one of the reasons Israel was allowed to succeed was because Chemosh, this god, was mad at them. So they put their political contests in spiritual light. So you're learning a little bit about Moabite religion as well. But who noticed that he also declared by name, it is the earliest non-biblical mention of God as Yahweh. He said he took the vessels of Yahweh and put them before Chemosh. Now, this is the same word as is sometimes called Jehovah. Do you want a little bit of backstory? Quick digression. You want, you want to know where Jehovah comes from? Okay. So the, um, in Exodus chapter 3, God revealed his name to, uh, to Moses at the, there at the burning bush. 
when he's sending them into the, into the land. The people ask, or Moses asked him, what if they ask me what your name is? What should I tell them? And he says on that occasion, this sacred name. It's translated, I am, because it's pretty close to the Hebrew word to be. And so God declares this name. It's in four letters, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. However, the the Hebrews thought that name was so sacred that they refused to say it. So they had a difference between what they called the Kathib and the Kire, what was read and what was said. They would never say it aloud. And if they wrote it, they had specific rules on what you were supposed to do with a pen. So they had, this is God's very special name according to the uh, the Hebrews, right? Um, So what they do when they read it is they'd read the name Adonai. It means Lord, which is why in your Bibles, you'll see this word translated capital L-O-R-D, Lord, okay? Well, eventually, Yahweh has no vowels. Y-H-W-H, there's no vowels there. So they took the vowels from what was said, Adonai, and they put it over Y-H-W-H. So it would be Y-E-H-O-W-A-H, Yehovah. But when you give that to a German scholar who doesn't have a Y and doesn't have a W, J-E-H-O-V-A-H, Jehovah. So anyway, a little history. Sorry. I'll stop being nerdy. But as much as we see in biblical scripture this very special name for God, you don't see that mentioned by almost anyone else. But this stone, Hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus, they knew God, and they knew the God of Israel. They knew his name, and they wrote it on this stone. Kind of cool. And that was to the northern kingdom, and honestly, they never believed, like, they had a hard time following God anyway, if you know your biblical history. But they knew. So that's kind of cool. So one more. Um, is that several of the Moabite cities are also mentioned over the course of this steel, this stone, um, that are also mentioned elsewhere in Scripture. If you go to Isaiah chapter 15, verse 2, Isaiah chapter 15, verse 2, um, it's talking about some judgment against Moab. And what he says is, he has gone up to the temple and to Dibon. Does that sound familiar? That's where they found this stone. To the place, to the high places to weep over Nebo and over Madiba, Moab wails, and on every bald head, every beard is sh- or every head is baldness, every beard is shorn. Both Madiba and Nebo are mentioned in this steel. Kind of cool. One more, um, Jeremiah chapter forty-eight and verse one. Jeremiah chapter forty-eight, verse one. It says. Woe to Nebo, for it is laid waste. Kiriathayim, which Mesha said that he built, is put to shame, it is taken. The fortress is put to shame and broken down. That's a really small point. But here's what you're getting from this, the Mesha stone. You're getting a picture of corroboration of Scripture. So I asked you a question at the beginning. How do you know the Bible is historically accurate when things like this are found? Telling you the same story about the same people at the same time, even if it's just the other side of the story, even if it was just Moabite propaganda. What you just got to see is corroboration of the biblical text, telling you it is true. So you can take with confidence the contents of 2 Kings chapter 3. He just told you about them. 
You can take with confidence then Second Kings, almost in, or First and Second Kings, almost in its entirety, because you get to see just how how accurate even this author was. Now I hate to extrapolate beyond that, but there's other archaeological evidence that vindicates other stories in the Bible. But what you just got then is one more piece of evidence to say the Bible is, in fact, historically accurate, and we can trust what it says. Thanks for studying with me tonight and letting me be a nerd. I want to tell you that the Bible is true. I want to tell you that when the Bible says something, it has validity and it has weight and it has things to say about our souls. It has things to say about God, about Jesus, and those things matter to us. And if they are true, they deserve our attention, they deserve even our obedience as well. So how's your relationship with God tonight? If you need a change in any way, if you need to become a Christian, we'd like to help you. If you're a Christian who's been struggling, we'd love to help you too. We'd love to uh, pray with you and for you. If you have any need, come forward while we stand and while we sing this song. pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we could come and worship you today and uh, study about your awesomeness and how how, how you provided everything for us. We're so thankful for the lesson tonight about the history and how things throughout time uh, 
prove your existence and, and um, verify what's been taught in, in your word. We pray, dear God, that you'll help each of us to go out into the world and, and disciple and let other people see that Jesus lives in us. And uh, when we stumble and fall at times, dear God, we pray that you'll allow us to be defeated. You'll allow others to come and help us to um, get back and become stronger and, and be a better light to the world. Uh, we have several people, um, I know at least in my family, that are struggling uh, with issues that need prayers and need strengthened. And we pray that you'll bless them and, and help them to get back and do the things they need to do. We also ask, dear God, that you be with um, our number here who struggle with illnesses and struggle with uh, health issues, that you'll be able to help them to overcome them, become stronger as well. We ask you to forgive us of our sins and help us to hate sin and what sin does to us in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.